Good morning. Good morning. And uh, welcome to, uh, this is a special Sunday, this is a baby blessing. So we do have some babies here. And looking forward to celebrating, rejoicing in God's goodness in our children today. Let's go ahead and stand and turn to number 44. Number 44. And I'll just let you know we do have a special program um, bulletin this morning. So if you don't have that, you might want to grab one and follow along with our service because it's a little bit different than usual. But excited about it. Number 44, Children of the Heavenly Father. children of the Heavenly Father if we know Jesus Christ. What a, what a uh, wonderful blessing that is. Let's, let's pray as we begin our service this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you that uh, because of what Jesus has done, we can be called your children. And uh, what a wonderful blessing that is. And Lord, I pray that you would be with us today as we uh, celebrate the blessings of children that you have given to the families here at our body, and I pray that this service would be honoring and glorifying to you. I pray that you would bless each one here and those uh, still coming. Uh, thank you for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm going to turn to the Bible this morning for our scripture reading and it is actually in your bulletin again if you need to get one we have some over on the table so so this is an abridged reading from the bulletin from the book of Luke it's from Luke chapter 2 verses 19 through 52 But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. 
And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, which thou hast prepared before the face of of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against, sword shall pierce through thy own soul also. That the, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city Nazareth. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Gary's going to come and share from the word this morning. Good morning. Just a quick word of instruction in terms of how the service is going to go since we're doing things just a little bit differently. Um, I'm supposed to speak a lot shorter today. <laughs> so that'll be the biggest trial of the day. And then after, if you're looking at the bulletin, it has the service in it, um, we'll have the um, uh, hymn and then the section of the service that I've titled Parental Presentations and Declarations and the five couples are listed there. I realize that there's many mothers wondering why didn't you put the baby's names down? Because I did it. No, no reason. <laughs> and then Joel will do a special uh, a musical piece of dedication and then at that point Dr. Summers will come up. <clears throat> After I finish my remarks here, I'm going to actually have the couples, if you would, come up with your children and sit on the first couple rows, except for the first child group. That would be Sarah and Carlos, which you will come all the way up front. And you'll present in the order that you have in. A word about Carlos and Sarah's. I've printed their remarks on the back, not because they're PC, but because with Carlos's accent, he was worried that maybe being nervous, he wouldn't enunciate clearly enough. So we'll be able to follow along and understand perfectly well what he's saying. So let's begin with the word of prayer. Lord, we come in Jesus' name and we thank you for this privileged moment to pause and as a congregation bring these children that have been born into our midst in these recent months before you and to stand beside them and mark, mark a day that we declare that they're your children 
We desire to raise them for you on your behalf. And we desire that you would bless our children so they might be useful to you in the age that we live, that you could raise them up as men and women of God to shine the light of Christ in a crooked and perverse generation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, before I get started with comments that are written, I would like to mention that um, some of you may be wondering why all of a sudden are we doing a baby, baby blessing service? And the answer is, somebody asked me, and upon thinking and going through the process, I recognized that was certainly an appropriate thing. I'm not just tacking it on at the end of the prayer time as sort of a, an informal blessing. I felt like it was probably appropriate to just pause and really focus in on what this process of baby blessing is all about. As you notice, I'm not calling it a baby dedication service. And because um, I think from my own perspective, the, the goal of the parents is to bless their children with the spiritual Christian heritage. And really the dedication is the parents dedicating themselves to that task. So if you look on the screen, it says a stand beside service. And you're probably wondering what in the world is a stand beside service? Well, attempting to find biblical perspective with what we're doing, I did go to Luke chapter two in this section that you read that we just read was part of the focus that I had and in that focus area um, it said that Mary and Joseph presented Jesus to the Lord so I said well pray a presentation service wonder what that Greek word means to present present him to the Lord and it literally means to stand beside so they brought their children to stand beside them before the Lord and it's really one of those occasions where we understand who owns the children, God, and who's appointed parents, God, and the parents are simply standing beside their, beside their child before God, acknowledging his role and their duty to him and their duty to the children. Um, I did not limit, um, you know, so some of you, this was like your 10th child and you're like, this is your first opportunity to do something like this and you're wondering why didn't we do this before? Um, really briefly um, the Church of Jesus Christ has suffered from confusion by attempts to dedicate babies in some fashion or another. Um, I do not believe in infant baptism because I do not believe an infant can be baptized according to the nature of baptism as expressed in the scripture. Baptism is a, um, I, I guess you could call it a, a sacrament if you want to use a, a loose term, but it's a specific sacrament that Jesus commanded, but it's exclusive, exclusively reserved for professing believers, professing Christians. You demonstrate your personal faith through that baptism process. So wanting to avoid that kind of confusion, the church got carried away with baptism. A quick little word of history. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but long before 400 AD, the church had corrupted the understanding of baptism to mean that when a child was baptized or whenever a Christian was baptized, that baptism itself washed away the sins. And we call that baptismal regeneration, but the church had fallen into that error a long, long time ago, imagining that baptism itself washes away sin. There's, we have baptismal services and we have spoken on the topic, so I don't want to get bogged down in that particular point. But going beyond that, recognizing that one of the errors that occurred by 400 AD, the church was trying to postpone baptism until you're about age 32. And the reason was these godly Christian families were raising up kids who were little rebels. And they were going out in the world, living like the world, getting caught up in sin of the world. And they um, 
had this false understanding of baptismal regeneration. So, okay, and this is a classic illustration of why men don't have any right to assemble doctrine as if they're understanding. We need to stick simply to the scripture. But men are so manipulative. So if you can believe it, believing that baptism washed away all your sins and all your guilt, and you're now totally without any sin at that moment, they got this bright idea, let's wait until age 32 because by then most rebels who were raised in the Lord will have turned back to the Lord and they can be baptized after all those wild oats were sown. And so that, that was the practice of the time of, of 400 AD. That's an, an amazing contrivance. Now when I was born and raised uh, with baptismal regeneration, the, they had gone back to baptizing infants because the theology was if a baby died before baptism they could never go to heaven and they would go instead to this place called limbo that's a, that's a word meaning I'm not sure where the baby is so this is it's imperative that we understand that this is not anywhere nearly related to a baptismal service and so what, what is it? Okay, so we're doing, we're calling it a stand beside service. And we're, parents are standing beside their children before the Lord, declaring, dedicating themselves to the Lord and raising their children and giving their children a blessing. But I've also included focus on blessing the mothers because mothers are a huge part of God's plan. Anybody notice the picture on the bulletin? It's a picture of a couple of mothers getting their kids ready and holding children. <clears throat> I really want us to pay close attention to the significant role of motherhood in this process of parents dedicating themselves, dedicating their raising their children, and the incredible role. So that the title for this morning's message is Saved in Childbearing. Saved in Childbearing. Let's, let's begin. First, let's chat briefly about the question, why focus on mothers? <clears throat> the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Abraham Lincoln. What is imperative for us to understand is that the most significant institution to form character and spiritual foundation is Christian marriage, Malachi 2, and the most significant role in that formative institution as God wants to shape the lives of young people for his service, most important role is motherhood. Motherhood is the most natural servant leader, and I say the word natural on purpose because God himself adjusted the natural state of women based upon his purpose and desire for that contribution of care and nurture to children in the home and to those things that count. Uh, we've talked about that on plenty of occasions so I won't go into it in any significant detail but it's important I, I love the little word Nezer when the woman was created Genesis 2 God said I'm going to make a Nezer fit for him. The word Nezer there is a Hebrew word for help. A help. And the word meet for King James means fit. A help appropriate, a help fit for him. Now, if you look at all of the Old Testament Hebrew, you'll discover that the word Nezer is only used of God and the wife. And so I, it, that elevates the role of the woman significantly to and I, and I say the natural servant leader because it's imperative that we understand true leadership under Christ is servant leadership. It's not self-assertion. It's not that kind of uh, postulation. And so what we, uh, um, again, these are messages from the past that we've shared, but from 1 Timothy 2, 9 to 15, it's imperative that we understand that in the New Testament, the Christian role of women in the church is to preserve that sacred role they have in the home. 
to preserve their uh, nurturing capacity into the focal point that it ought to be. Uh, again, I have a whole series on this topic from days gone by, but let me just suffice it to say quickly this, and that is a woman's gifts and a woman's sensitivity based upon those gifts is huge and significant. And I, I often call it the feminine gift that God deposited in her, Genesis 3.16. And that particular process, what's imperative to understand is, unless the woman, the spiritual woman, deliberately places herself under the headship of her husband, she is naturally going to run ripshot over him. And the reason why she's going to run, maybe a rough shot is the better word, the reason why she's going to run roughshod over him is because her sensitivity is so much higher and she sees danger and risk so much quicker and she's a whole lot more naturally instinctively unselfish where we husbands are a whole lot more naturally and instinctively selfish so the highest moral operative in our spirit is doing what's right when you and I get to that place where we understand and know something is right and we recognize this I must do, I must do what's right regardless of what anybody else does. But when we get to that place, um, the sense of rightness that stirs up in the heart of a woman is so significant that if it's just released to run, as it were, according to its em emotional intensity, uh, she will have a tendency for two things to take place. She'll tend to lead instead of follow. And in the process of leading, the capacity to be deceived is significant because the intensity of care, as soon as we are intensely confident something's right, that becomes what is right and our actions are based upon that intense feeling Whereas the responsibility for proper perspective and leadership comes to the husband. And I want to say this kindly, but we husbands, we fathers, relatively come kicking and screaming to the sacrificial place of service in our home. And it's the grace and the blessing that God has placed upon our women, upon our wives, that great desire they have, yearning for what's right and good and healthy for the family, that itself forms a forge of actually forcing us to be thoughtful where we would naturally be careless. And then um, I am recognizing that the Old Testament rituals concerning birth were focused on women, which we read this morning in Luke chapter 2. So just a quick comment here, God owns the children. If you have a child, you've been blessed with a privilege. God has granted you an opportunity to serve him in an eternal way by serving the children that God is putting into your home, that God has put into your home. And so, really quickly, we're familiar with these verses. God has ordained parental authority, Ephesians 6. to expect our children to obey us. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, it's a beautiful snapshot. If you think that you're going to hold authority over your child because you say so, <laughs> you are really in trouble. And especially in the culture that we live in today, that is not going to happen for a very long amount of time. Because everybody has a strong emotional sense of right and wrong based on things that pertain to them. We all are naturally deceived by our strong emotional sense of right and wrong about things that pertain to us. And we always will enter into that place when a parent's no seems to us to be an injustice, no matter who we are, how we're raised, or how nice our parents were humdy dum sometime in the past. We reach that place where we don't emotionally agree with the no our parents have given us, and therefore we are tempted to simply supersede their judgment because we know better. 
And so it's an imperative foundational doctrine that children learn to obey their parents in the Lord. Notice the little phrase in the Lord because it is the Lord we almost learn to obey. For a parent, no simpler mechanism is available for you to approach that uh, leadership role in your children's lives than to recognize your duty is to teach your child that God's in charge and that you obey God and they'll never succeed in life with any kind of happy life on this side an expectation of eternal life unless they also concede and submit to God and so as you train your children you extend to your child your own simple obedience and say I am doing what I'm doing because I fear God and I believe God and I'm, and I'm trusting God so I'm doing what I need to and I know you might not appreciate it but I want you to understand you can never ever ever make a mistake by trusting God in your circumstance and so even when mom and dad are potentially just stupid and ignorant by your understanding it's okay God's eternally smart and wiser God's even wiser than you and so young child you can trust him at the place of your tension because you know that's the place of safety that's the place of hope he commands parents to be intentional on bringing their children up on the nurture and admonition of the Lord now <clears throat> I realize that when we look around in the world today that naturally in the culture parents tend to have children based upon their own outlook and their own understanding. Children, having children is often postponed. It's like a cultural reality. Whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. No, don't have kids till you're ready. And it's just the natural order of things. Until you're ready, what, 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 what may that mean? may mean that right now you want to have a party and play around and have some fun on your own so why in the world should you bother having kids that they get in the way so the world doesn't understand that children aren't a personal possession to the world children are so much exclusively a personal possession so they have them when they want to and then they raise them according to their want to and it's a sad state of affairs because when you're raising kids according to your want to, once your kid, a kid gets in your home, your want to's cross very often. And if you're only gonna to bring to the table your want to's, you're gonna have not any real success whatsoever of coaching and directing your children's want to's, but you will have a huge amount of conflict starting at the 13th month, if not sooner. <laughs> so, uh, then in, in Luke 2, which we read, which I'll get to a bit, just briefly at the next panel, but God directed rituals for newborns, and we saw the one with Mary and Joseph and Jesus. And so, and I want to be careful with what I'm saying. There are no New Testament ordained rituals for our children. But it is absolutely imperative for us to understand that two things are true. When you're the Lord's, you recognize that your family is the Lord's and your obligation to God is something that you need to be determined to do. So on the one point, you have to have a vision that your children have to obey you even though you are not so perfect. And number two, you have to be intentional. You have to ask questions. And therefore you are the ones that need to be dedicated to this question of how am I gonna raise a child for God? And believe it or not, Raising a child for God is the most significant action and activity in terms of human relationship that you can conduct because everything finds its meaning and answer back in the eternal relationship with God as we find ourselves on the other side in heaven by God's grace or eternally lost because we never paid attention to raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And then lastly, while God owns the children, I just want to underscore again that Genesis 3.16 passage, God has given significant emotions to the mother. And that, those emotions 
are for spiritual direction and care. And it's not, they're not emotions that, that rule, they're emotions that must be governed. On the one hand, the woman must learn how to govern those fears by faith in the Lord and seeking the Lord to give her comfort and confidence where it's not coming from her husband. And on the other hand, those emotions are given for direction and care just in terms of a central sense of, of alarm. Uh, it is impossible for a woman not to express her emotions of concern. And if you think you can stop it, <laughs> think again. But while the woman must learn to govern those, especially when her husband's not on duty, which we often aren't, on the other hand, the husband needs to learn to respond to those yearnings with, with knowledge, with understanding, recognizing what's really going on. The positive outlook which we bring to the table when we are engaged in this process of raising kids, positive outlook helps us so much. The mismanagement by a woman of her emotions can be reviewed in a very sad fashion if you read the book of Proverbs and discover the number of Proverbs that speak to a woman who's totally lost control and refuses any control over her emotions at all so that it's described in terms that simply say a man would rather be on a rooftop alone by himself than in a castle with this drippy faucet, with this woman who's warring with words. So it's a, it's a huge point of reality. And yet on the other hand, that, that spiritual process is there. Each one can contribute by the grace of the Lord, and each one must. Um, but, but that brings to the table this whole process of dedication. Continuing on the thought that God owns the children, number five, Wait a minute. Oh, brother. And some kind of a slide error. Moving along. When I'm making slides, I, re I, I duplicate the last one and then make something. And so I didn't duplicate it. I duplicated it, but I didn't add anything new. Sorry. OK, the blessing service of Jesus, <clears throat> which we read from Luke chapter 2, which we read in the bulletin. It's only a couple things that I want to draw out in terms of this attention. Yes, this was an Old Testament ritual. It was required. And so some of the language of the text was according to the law of Moses. And there were two aspects. There was a real brief mention of the circumcision of Jesus. That when he was eight days old, he was circumcised. And he was given the name Jesus. That was a ritual. In fact, that's probably the closest ritual that you can say to a parent dedication and that when you circumcised your children you were you were marking them as a part of God's covenant and uh, setting them aside for that place. Uh, we do not have any New Testament corollary to circumcision. If you attempt to circumcise your children according to Old Testament ritual, Paul says you have fallen from grace if you're going to do the mosaic circumcision thing, then you've got to keep the law, the whole entire law, in order to be saved. So that's not how we're saved. We're saved by promise, not by ritual. But that was part one. Then as the text continued, then it said, after Mary's number of days required before her purification, then she also came to the temple to offer up the sacrifice that she was required to one of poverty was two young turtle doves. And so we're going to the temple deliberately for the purpose of the ritualistic cleansing of Mary after the birth of a male child. And it says in the text to present him to the Lord, meaning to stand beside the child before the Lord. It's a beautiful snapshot, a beautiful picture. Now. The blessing part of the service was unexpected. It wasn't normal that there was somebody standing around at the temple waiting for the next baby to come so they could give a blessing. So in the case of Jesus, of course, we can fully understand who he was being the son of God was significant. 
and so he was able to be uh, a special mention given to him. And I want to just mention a couple things. Simeon blessed Jesus and Simeon blessed Mary. And I think if we're going to have a service of any kind of presentation, the vision of blessing our moms and blessing the children as the focus. And so as we go through today, that is the intention, our goal in the process. But I want to just mention Simeon had a vision about the blessing. <clears throat> Christian, you and I, if we're Christians, are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit resides inside each believer. It's such a singular aspect of who a Christian is that in Romans 8 the text says if you don't have the Spirit of God in you then you're not a Christian. So you become a Christian upon that new birth when the Holy Spirit comes into you. But I want us to understand that as soon as Christ died on the cross and that new order was established, that's a live living order and you and I must learn to walk in the Spirit. Now dads, I want to say something to you. Marriage is tough. Raising children is tough. Life is tough. And if you and I think that we as husbands and fathers can just coast along in the world and bump into one tough thing after another and then remark, what's that for? If, if you think that we can bring a blessing to our family, you're kidding yourself. The Christian life is one of anticipatory vision. The Christian life is one of anticipatory vision. What does that mean? Well, it means I'm anticipating stuff that isn't yet visible, and so it's a vision. It's something that I'm recognizing in my spirit that I don't visibly see. I'll illustrate with one of my personal illustrations. The first time I had that kind of vision. I walk in on my wife holding our firstborn son and she's enraptured with maternal delight at such an incredible gift of a little baby. Her heart was filled with joy and excitement and <clears throat> I spoke these anticipatory words of vision into her ear. Just remember, honey, you're holding a sinner that's on his way to hell, and the only hope we have is paying attention and raising him in the nurtured admission of the Lord. <laughs> now, I have never been known for my grace. I guess we'll see that all the more when I get to heaven and say, oh my, did I do that? <laughs> but I think the spirit was right. And I proceeded to just remind us as a couple that the moment of enthralling joy, sweetness, and endearment, that was not the real moment. The real moment is we have just entered into the battle of our lives. Our children are born dead in their trespasses and sins. And unless we as parents have a vision to anticipate that spiritual reality, we're going to one day ask the question, where did that come from? How come you did that? And we're going to be personally offended by the little sweet thing that crosses us. And we're going to think, what have I ever done to deserve that? And we're, and we're going to make it personal about us. And all of a sudden, at a very early age, our kids are going to be our enemies. And, and we're going to be candidates for child abuse as parents. Because it's going to be all about us. But if we have that anticipatory vision, then we can stand beside our child before the Lord 
And we as parents can dedicate ourselves to that task. And we can remember that our child will sin. And that's not going to be a surprise. We anticipated this. And we're going to deal with our children's sin in the fashion in which the scripture teaches us. There is a redeemer. And it's not going to be an easy battle. And even though I had wonderful anticipatory vision with my first child in the opening rounds, there's just something really weird about humanity. We just keep tricking ourselves into thinking that if I try hard enough, I can get everything arranged and my kids are going to like not have any problems. And so we're going to be constantly trying to create a form of perfectionism that's never going to happen. And you may say, like I said, when I did not have a refreshed understanding of anticipatory vision, and I said to one of my children, did you do thus and so? Yes, Daddy. Why did you do that? I don't ever, I don't ever want to see you do that again. Yes, Daddy. And right then the Holy Spirit spoke to me with anticipatory vision. <clears throat> Excuse me, did you, do you have a law that you can pass in your family that will make your kids righteous? Wow, that's something I didn't get to do yet. Oh, that's right. By the keeping of the law, nobody's going to be justified. So I had to interrupt myself and my languishing of emotion. And I had to tell my child, <clears throat> you know why you did that? I'll tell you why you did that. The Lord reminded me just now. You did that because you're a sinner. You were born in sin. Your only natural instinct is sin. And you need a redeemer. And I was able to bring anticipatory vision into my moment of child discipline by God's grace. It's an imperative that we understand, parents, that this occasion of blessing our children and dedicating ourselves to the task has more to do with vision than anything else. Anna. Now it was interesting, Simeon had a vision that said, you're not dying until you see the Messiah. So he was like excited. He was 794 years old. Just kidding. He was old, but he wasn't that old. <laughs> and so Anna comes in, she was also very old. And she had just been serving the Lord in the temple night and day, fasting and praying. And when she walks in, the Holy Spirit gave her instant vision, instant recognition. And she also gave a blessing. I want us to understand one thing. Today's service of blessing ought to be visionary. But dad, especially dad and mom, it's imperative that you understand that you must maintain proper spiritual vision throughout your life as a parent in order to do the right thing. You will always be able to bless your child when you have the vision that's correct. Now, we have for the last panel the salvation of Anna, excuse me, of Hannah. And if you'll open your Bible to um, 1 Samuel, I will read a portion of the scripture. <clears throat> but I find Hannah such a, a huge um, backstory by which we can recognize just the incredible gift that God has put in the heart of women to be moms and the incredible burden they bear when that is denied them. It's a huge, huge difficulty. And on the screen I have a couple quick comments to try to keep my comments limited. Um, she had a sorrowful heart. This is 1 Samuel chapter 1. She had an incredibly sorrowful heart. She was just vexed. And not only that, In the living situation that she was in, she had someone who continuously mocked her at the place of her sorrow. The lack of having a child was so huge and it was inc just increasing the anxiety of her soul. And so we find in the context this prayer of faith of someone with a sorrowful heart and I, I want us to remember that in the course of parenting, you will have sorrowful hearts, period. It's going to happen. 
but that's a help because it reminds you and it brings you to that place of contact where you need to come before the Lord and lay out your burdens and lay out your concerns and it's a wonderful thing you can you can tell God how you feel he knows how you feel and you can make your request but the key there being that you pray in faith now the little story about Eli thinking she was drunk a sad sad story but I want us to understand just how huge God is in the in comparison by the time you get to the end of chapter 2 you define that Eli is a really lousy dad and he's got kids that are now adults sharing in temple ritual worship responsibilities and violating it with the most vile means possible and Eli never had anticipatory vision of how to raise his kids you need anticipatory vision to tell them no but you need to do more than tell them no you'll never win someone by words only if you think you can win everybody by words only you're deceiving yourself because there has to be that taste a taste of authority whereby you face and understand the fact God is in charge not me and so it says at the end of Hebrews I mean at the end of first uh, Samuel 2 he never restrained he never restrained his kids that means to take the necessary action to prevent their action from continuing that's what restraint is now in that particular place of this lousy guy he had a position of authority and children if you're able to understand this point I'm gonna admit I, I read first Samuel 1 2 and 3 and I read it again and I'm like you're kidding me this this vile man Eli and his horrible sons and he's looking on Hannah and calling her a drunk apparently in his lack of anticipatory vision he didn't know what it was like to see somebody earnestly pray to the Lord and so he mocked one that he saw with a crude kind of assessment and a crude kind of remark but I want us to understand something here this huge important part of that role he still was the Lord's high priest and she spoke to him with reverence for God and the position he had in before God not because she necessarily felt like he was being fair or right and it's really important children and parents you need to understand this as a part of your parenting if you think that the door spins only with a right perfectly right approach by the person in authority and if you don't get that perfect response you don't have to comply if that's what you think you're raising children of Belial because all Satan ever needs to do to your child is to convince your child that your parents stupid they don't know what they're talking about they're old fogies and look at all their faults anyway and I don't have to respect them and see it's not about respecting the parent as an abstract individual it's someone who's an anointed position before the Lord and it's God you need to always be looking for it's God you always need to be seeing Hannah was seeking the Lord in the temple of God as she ought according to her custom Eli was the priest of the Lord in the temple of the Lord and she respected him as such as she respected God and the amazing thing with that wicked man when he heard her story and her plea don't don't call me such a wicked person I'm a woman of a sorrowful heart he declared the Lord grant you your wish the Lord gave him a prophetic role to play in spite of his unworthiness never deny yourself the privilege of God's prophetic influence into your life because you look at the weakness of that person that God has put over you instead of seeing God in it and that's that's the dynamic role today as we stand beside our children and as we stand beside you parents that's the dynamic role this is about God winning the confidence in the hearts of our children in spite of all the difficulty and even sin around them 
Now, <clears throat> the fourth point in chapter one, after the weaning, I, I, think, I think it's on record as the longest weaning in history. Samuel was 17 years old. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> when we started having children and we uh, adopted nursing right away, the, the whole concept of how long and when you need, wean is always kind of like one of those things you try to play by thumb and or rule or whatever. And so we, we use this particular story as a guideline and we're saying, well now, child's gotta be old, <laughs> old enough to you know, be able to be away from mom and home. They have to have some level of maturity. We never figured it out, but we said he's got to at least be three years old. But we, the text doesn't say. But she weaned him and brought him to the temple. And it's important to recognize she was turning him over to the Lord. Now he's going to be under the care of one of the vilest fathers in Israel. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about that. When you are so focused on the Lord, so that you're looking to him, and that you're seeing him, and that you're, you have an anticipatory vision by him and about him and in your circumstances, that's the life of faith. And God's gonna meet you down the path of the life of, faith, life of faith. It does not matter what the natural circumstances are in terms of risk and danger. In fact, what happens is too often Satan uses the risk and dangers that we see with our eyes to mute our faith, to excuse us from having anticipatory vision and our trust of God. But it's absolutely necessary because it's about God and my faith in God. And I'm telling you this, God knows when that's in your heart. He knows your faith and he's gonna bless you and honor you according to that faith. Now, Let's open our Bibles together and I'm going to close. I'm a little bit long, I apologize, but we're going to close with the release of Hannah. Now I started by saying something about that saved in childbearing. That comes out of 1 Timothy chapter 2 and that little section there, 9 to 17 or whatever the verses were. And the reality is the woman's role is so huge and her gifts are so enormous that God wants to d dedicate and devote them exclusively to the raising and to the care of children for the purpose of spiritual seed being raised and grown. Now I just want to just, if you continue in faith, here's what happens and here's an incredible prophecy. If he, excuse me, uh, no, uh, First Samuel chapter two. It's gonna read Hannah's prayer and then we're gonna continue the service. And Hannah prayed and said, my heart rejoices in the Lord and my horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over my enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord. There is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceedingly proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired themselves out for bread, and they that were hungry ceased so that the barren has borne seven, and she that had many children is waxed feeble. The Lord kills, and the Lord makes alive. He brings down to the grave, and he brings up. The Lord makes the poor rich, and he brings low and lifts up. He raises the poor out of the dust, and lifts the beggar from the dunghill to set them among the princes, and to make them inherit the throne of glory for the pillars of the Lord, for, for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he hath set the world upon them. He will keep his feet of his saints 
and the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by, this, for by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength to his king, and exalt the horn of his anointed. And Elkanah went to Ramah to his house, and the child did minister to the Lord before Eli the priest. Credible prayer of vision. Prayer of dedication of oneself to the Lord. And it is that simple. Life measured by our circumstances and our strengths has no hope. Life placed intentionally into the hand of God by faith will be blessed. And that which seems to be so wonderful in the eyes of men will be eventually proven to be a facade and a pretense by arrogant, proud people. And what seems to be so easy to despise and so despicable in the eyes of men will be lifted up as we trust the Lord in all things. Let's pray. Father, we come in Jesus' name and we recognize that as we take this special day to set aside the memorial of blessing our children and our wives and dedicating ourselves as parents to that visionary task of raising our children for you, we ask that you would do just that, that you would bless us in our endeavor, bless us with humility, so that we're not carried away by overconfidence. Bless us with strength so that we're not beaten down by our adversaries. And bless us with victory, Lord, so that the fullness of the end is seen to your praise and glory. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Now we're gonna to stand together and we're gonna sing hymn number 374. O oh, love that will not let me go. from thee I lay and 
doth thy glory dead and from the ground their blossoms red life that shall endless be amen okay you may be seated now if it's uh, not too difficult if the parents can come to the front. Uh, Tim and Christina, you're probably close enough to the front, so is Joel and Michaela. But if others could come in, Carlos and Sarah, you're going to come up first anyway. Just a reminder what Carlos has spoken, will be speaking, is on the back for interpretation. And um, the goal was to try to have you a little bit close to up front, but we're actually, there's not going to be any further ado here. We're going to go through the different couples and their presentations, starting with Sarah and Carlos, and ending with Sarah and Matt. Come on up. Good morning. Um, I pray for this child and the Lord has granted me what I ask into, of him. So now I give him to the Lord for his whole life he will be given over to the Lord. First Samuel 1 Samuel 127-28 We name it you, Jaden, because of his meaning, Jehovah, God, has heard. God heard our many prayers for our little one and sent you. Your middle name, Alexander, I daddy choose because of his meaning, protector of men. Our prayers for you is that you will grow in the strength and wisdom of God. Having a heart to the desires to love, serve, obey, and trust in Jesus with your whole heart. We pray you will have a heart that strives to care and protect those who cannot protect themselves. May you have the strength and courage to stand up for what is right and just no matter what the cost. We are so very grateful to the Lord for allowing us to be your parents. We pray that with the Lord help we'll, we will be able to train and point you to him who loves you far more than we ever could. We dedicate you to our lovely Savior Jesus Christ and in trust you are your future to him who knows all things. Here are some verses we ask your parents hope and pray you will come to love and understand throughout your life. I, ne I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I send you apart. Jeremiah 1, 5. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall be not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, 
but in order that the world might be saved through him. John 3, 16, 17. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and let not on your own understanding. In all ways submit to him, and he will make you pass straight. Proverbs 3, 5, 6. For I know the, pa the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, for give you a future and a hope. Jeremiah 29, 11. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of light, with who there is no variations or shifting shadow. James 1, 7. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shiny on you and be gracious to, to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Numbers 6, 24, 26. We love you, Jaden Alexander, and pray the Lord blessing on your life. morning. Um, this is a, we're gr very grateful that, uh, can you hear me? We're very grateful that we have this opportunity. We've never done this before and, and I'm, I'm glad that someone in the congregation suggested we do this. And um, we thought about having all of our children come up here and, and bless them as well. But um, we've, we realized, you know, it, we, all of our children have been blessed. We've, we've prayed for and dedicated them to the Lord. Um, them all. I just never through a formal uh, gathering like this. But um, this has been our, our heart's desire um, for why we've had children. It, it hasn't been just because we like changing diapers or like the medical bills or like the additional difficulties that come along with having children. Most people look at those as the reasons not to have children, <laughs> but um, our, our desire has always been that we would raise children for the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and that there would be eternal fruit from their lives. Right, children? <laughs> and um, we're just... Uh, so grateful to the Lord for the children that he's given us, the ten blessings. The Bible says that children are a blessing from the Lord, or a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the, fruit of the womb is his reward. And I'd like to read um, the passage that uh, was what we, what allowed us to settle on Micaiah's name, is why we, ch we chose this name for him. We were wondering about what to name this little, this little guy, and we read this account in one of our family Bible readings, and um, it was really uh, a, a precious and encouraging story. Second Chronicles 18 says, Now Jehoshaphat had great riches and honor and made a marriage alliance with Ahab. And after some years, he went down to Ahab in Samaria, and Ahab killed an abundance of sheep and oxen for him and for the people who were with him and induced him to go up against Ramoth-Gilead. 
Ahab, king of Israel, said to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, will you go with me to Ramoth Gilead? He answered, I am as you are. My people as, are as your people. We will be with you in the war. And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, inquire first of the Lord. Inquire first for the word of the Lord. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, 400 men, and said to them, Shall we go to battle against Ramoth Gilead, or shall we refrain? And they said, Go up, for God will give it into the hand of the king. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here another prophet of the Lord, of whom we may inquire? And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man by whom we, we may inquire of the Lord. Micaiah, the son of Imla. But I hate him, for he never prophesies anything good concerning me, but always evil. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. Then the king of Israel summoned an officer and said, Bring quickly Micaiah, the son of Imla. Now the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, were sitting on their thrones, arrayed in their robes. And they were sitting at the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets were prophesying before them. And Zedekiah, the son of Chenna, made for himself horns of iron and said, Thus saith the Lord, with these you shall push the Syrians until they are destroyed. And all the prophets prophesied so and said, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and triumph. The Lord will give it into the hand of the king. And the messenger who went to summon Micaiah said to him, Behold, the words of the prophets with one accord are favorable to the king. Let your word be like the word of one of them, and speak favorably. But Micaiah said, As the Lord lives, what my God says, that I will speak. And when he had come to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we refrain? And he answered, Go up and triumph. They will be given into your hand. But the king said to him, How many times shall I make you swear that you speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? And he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let each return to his home in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did not I tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? And Micaiah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab, the king of Israel, that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said one thing, and another said another. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord, saying, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, By what means? And he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, You are to entice him, and you shall, you shall succeed. Go out and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of these your prophets. The Lord has declared disaster concerning you. Then Zedekiah the son of Chenna came near and struck Micaiah on the cheek and said, Which way did the Spirit of the Lord go from me to speak to you? And Micaiah said, Behold, you shall see on that day when you go into an inner chamber to hide yourself. And the king of Israel said, Seize Micaiah and take him back to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus saith says the king, put this fellow in prison and feed him with meager rations of bread and water until I return in peace. And Micaiah said, if you return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, hear all you peoples. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into battle, but you will wear your robes and the king of Israel disguised himself, and they went into battle. Now the king of Syria had commanded the captains of his chariots, fight with neither small nor great, but only with the king of Israel. As soon as the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, they said, It is the king of Israel. 
So they turned to fight against him. And Jehoshaphat cried out, and the Lord helped him. And God drew them away from him. For as soon as the captains of the chariots saw that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back from pursuing him. But a certain man drew his bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the scale of armor and the breastplate. Therefore he said to the driver of his chariot, Turn around and carry me out of the battle, for I am wounded. And the battle continued that day, and, all the, king of Israel, and the king of Israel was, prepped, was propped up in his chariot facing the Syrians until evening. Then at sunset he died. One of the privileges of parents is that they get to name their child. The name of a child is the first form of blessing a parent gives to their child, and often intended as an initiation for the life purpose and, di and direction of that child as desired by his parents. This has been our intention for our children as we have named them. We want them to be instilled with an eternal biblical purpose for their life while also declaring to the world that we are Christians, that these children have a spiritual purpose, and that we are raising them for the king. Our son Micaiah was given his name because we want our son to be a God-fearing, courageous, and fearless man like the prophet Micaiah. Micaiah the prophet was willing to speak the truth regardless of the unpopularity of what he knew he must say, regardless of how much pressure he faced to say something that would go along with what was popular or trendy. He was willing to speak, to speak the truth regardless of the embarrassment of being ostracized and outcast and not accepted by the crowd. We live in a world that judges us based on how many friends we have on Facebook or how many likes our post receives or if we've endorsed the party's presumptive candidate for president. If you go along with the flow and give consent to the crowd, you will be praised and accepted by the crowd. However, a true leader and man of God will have his, at his focus the glory of God and will do what is righteous, but not what the crowd says is right. He will lead with principle and not for popularity. He will operate with integrity and not for image. Above all, he will walk in the fear of God and will not fear what man can do to him. With that, um, I guess, uh, should I go ahead and pray for Micaiah, or is that's another time? Okay, thank you. All right. Well, this is going to be short and sweet, because... I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to make it today or not, so uh, this, is, this is Esther Joy, and uh, it mean, um, Esther means star, and, and we really wanted her to be someone who, who loved God and, and stood for Him, you know, in the hard times, and was there for such time as this, you know, like, whatever situation that she found herself in, that she, that she would be strong and, and courageous and that she would not back down or fear, uh, but that she, you know, she, you know, she'd be able to stand before uh, 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 rulers and wise men and, and be able to you know, stand for the truth and you know, be a star in the darkness. And um, joy means to, you know, it's just, well, it's, it's also her, her mom's middle name, but it's just a nice, it's something that, that I really appreciate in life is the ability to have joy and to be joyful so I think she'll she's she's already a joy in our lives and uh, but we watch we just pray that she <laughs> she is um, that she you know learns to grow and to uh, well, that she grows and learns learns to honor God in, in all that she does And you all know the uh, story of Esther well, so I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't need to read to read to read that though. But Esther, uh, so you want to say something? So you want to say hi? Okay. Thank you.
morning. This is Liam. <clears throat> so Liam, uh, his full name is Liam Chamberlain and uh, Liam means resolute protector and Chamberlain means uh, servant of the master and uh, one of the things, well, a couple things that we, uh, reason why we chose Liam is like several of the other parents have already mentioned, but we live in a interesting time. I think that's what Dr. Summers always says. Uh, and we look around and we see that there's a lot of There's just a lot of corruption, there's a lot of pressure to basically give up what is right and what is true. And even amongst believers, uh, you know, we have seen even from our generation a lot of people who have chosen to, uh, to leave the faith in some form or another. And our desire was to give Liam a name that would reflect our desire that he would be someone who would be, who would hold fast to uh, the things of the Lord, no matter what, uh, no matter you know who is trying to pressure him or turn him away, despite the uh, opposition that he may face. Um, and to become that protector of the things that are good. Uh, there's, you know, we read, read every day about how so many of the things that are, you know, we, we took for granted, our parents and grandparents maybe took for granted, and now they're questioned, and they're not, you know, they're not universal anymore. So that's why we chose... Um, Liam, we chose Chamberlain for a couple reasons. One is that we'd, we'd like the meaning because it means the servant of the master and that was the other element that we wanted for Liam to understand that his resoluteness would grow out of his relationship with the Lord Jesus. Because there's no greater connection than when it's from the Lord himself that he draws his conviction and his courage and we wanted him to understand that he would be a servant of the Lord of Jesus and the other reason we chose Chamberlain was for a man we've come to really respect from our history Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain who as we've gotten the chance to, to research and study more really was a uh, a man of the Lord he loved the Lord very much and lived in very difficult times, different circumstances than what we find ourselves in, but he had to make some very difficult decisions, um, and, but he stood by what he chose to do, and as some of you, you probably are aware, he eventually became a, a leader in, in uh, the Union Army during the Civil War. Uh, he was at the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, but he was, he emulated those qualities. He, from all accounts we can see, was a very generous natured person. Uh, he was very courageous, uh, but just had a tender heart. Someone said he had uh, the soul of a lion and the heart of a woman. <laughs> Which is an interesting description, but in some ways that, that encompasses that idea of tenderness to the Lord and to others but a fierceness of commitment to what is good and right and true so um, with those things in mind one of the passages that we wanted to share as kind of encompassing those different things were is from 2nd Timothy chapter 2 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7 says, 
You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hard work working farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Our desire for Liam is that, first of all, God would fill his heart with how much he loves him. So that he can walk in that strength, the grace of the Lord. And so that he can be strong in following God. And so that he can be a warrior for his kingdom with a heart that seeks to please Christ and not men. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, as Gary was saying, it's a... The aspect for us is, the, is dedicating ourselves to help him with those things. And one passage that stuck out to me for a long time as far as, as a household and, and now as parents is from Second Kings 23. This passage is from a, a time when a young man named Josiah had become king in Judah. And if you remember part of the story, uh, Josiah had had a heritage that wasn't particularly godly. Um, his grandfather was Manasseh, who was one of the most wicked kings in Israel uh, and Judah. And part of Josiah's desire as a king was to bring a restoration to Judah following the Lord and he made uh, very very hard efforts to do that and one of the things that happened uh, is that he brought everybody together to hear the book of the law read and this is where I wanted to take us back to today 2nd Kings 23 chapter um, sorry chapter 23 verse 1 says, Now the king sent them to gather all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to him. And the king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah, and with him all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the house of the Lord. Then the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of this covenant which were written in this book. And all the people took a stand for the covenant. So to us, we're kind of envisioning ourselves standing beside a pillar here. I don't actually have a pillar, but standing like King Josiah did and saying, Lord, we're here because we're committed to following you, to keeping your commandments, your testimonies with all our heart and soul and to perform the words of the covenant, to follow Christ in our home so that we can disciple Liam in the way that he goes and in the nurture and admonition of the Lord Jesus Christ. So pray for us to do those things. <laughs> Thank you.
Our, our baby is walking up here, so that means we must be a little late. I think two years too late. Um, yeah, this, it's a little, not awkward, but it's a little interesting. We have, obviously, we have six children and one on the way. And we have, as a couple in private, de dedicate each one of our children to the Lord. But so to, when we were asked if we wanted to get, have the opportunity to dedicate publicly, we didn't want to we, we say no, but our other children just want to know we, we have prayed for you and you know that. And, but today, I guess we're bringing El uh, Justice Elijah up. And again, since this is the first time, I had written kind of a formal brief um, dedication. Then I had a few verses that um, the Lord kind of laid in my heart and encouraged me with. So, um, first of all, I just wanted to recognize we that the Lord has entrusted justice as a gift to us. We we know that He belongs to the Lord, um, and just like Hannah offered or prayed for Samuel and then um, dedicated his life to the Lord, we do the same and recognize that justice will always be in the Lord's care and we are just um, stewards to instruct and to train. So I would, um, in spite of our Sarah and I's weaknesses and imperfections, we trust that the Lord will use those broken things in our lives to let his light of the gospel shine forth and um, pray that justice will one day come to know the Lord as his savior. So we ask for strength and wisdom as we raise this child after God's holy word. We ask that the Lord would keep him walking on the path that leads to eternal life, help him to overcome temptation to this world and the sin the Bible says that can so easily entangle us. We ask for the Lord to give him um, the Holy Spirit that would lead and guide him, assist him to grow in wisdom and stature and grace and knowledge, and that he would one day come to know the Lord. May this child, Justice here, serve the Lord faithfully with his whole heart, and he would be devoted to the Lord all the days of his life. And then we pray that Justice would discover the joy of God's presence and would have a daily relationship with um, Jesus Christ. And we ask that the Lord would give us the grace not to neglect our responsibilities as parents and ask the Lord's blessing as we try to train up, up our children and in particular justice here. And we commit to raise this child for the glory of, of God's name and may this child's life be a testimony of God's faithfulness um, kind of in spite of our failures. And along the line of training, if, if, you, if you're a parent, you obviously have a child and parents, uh, for me in particular, I know it's, it's encouraging um, when I read Hebrews 12, it says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And as parents, there seems daily you will be giving instruction and you'll think, didn't I just do this yesterday? And you know, well, that was with another child, honey. So be faithful in, in the race that you're running because um, it's, it's so crucial and important for our, our children to hear, hear the word and to hear the instruction and to be constantly being reminded. And, looking to Jesus, the author and finish, finisher of our faith. He has run the race, he ran a perfect race, and he has um, unlimited amount of grace to sustain us in times of, of struggle and trial. And then, I guess ultimately, we know, after talking to lots of different parents, and the desire of Sarah and I's heart is uh, in Third John uh, 4, verse 4, says, says, I have no greater joy and to hear that my children walk in the truth. And hmm. and that is what we desire. More than any um, earthly aspiration, but, but just that they would come to know Jesus. And
Sorry, I didn't think I was going to be emotional. <laughs> but that they would come to know Jesus and trust him as their savior and, and bring honor to his name. So, thank you. morning again. <laughs> so I was um, asked to share a, a song. I A um, couple, couple years ago I was asked to sing at one of the graduations, Walkersville graduations, and they wanted me to sing the song Find Us Faithful by Steve Green. Um, probably most of you have heard that at some point in time. I, I grew up with it and I was thinking as I was getting ready to sing it today that this song had a whole new dynamic to this time <laughs> because I have a son <laughs> so before it was always just kind of like well may all who come behind us find us faithful yeah yeah you know those people that might hear about me somewhere at some point but now I have a son who very literally is is coming behind me and um, that's the context of the song today. I, sometimes the context is in other things like a graduation or something else, but it was just a really good reminder as parents that's, that's tangible. We, we have children who are f following behind us and it, we, we're going to leave a legacy one way or the other. Uh, you know, just about everybody in this room, most of us have a, a heritage from our parents that is treasure, a treasure for us. Uh, that's why we're, in some ways, it's, it's, a lot of times that's why we're even here. <laughs> and, you know, we want to make that same commitment to, to leave that same sort of heritage and, and treasure chest, as it were, for them to, to draw from. Um, Obviously, there's a bigger meaning too, and, and that our lives are always going to have an impact more than we realize on, on others. But just today, specifically, think of your kids, um, and hopefully, be a blessing. <clears throat> journey of the narrow road. Those who've gone before us light the way, cheering on the faithful, encouraging the weary, their lives a stirring testament to God's sustaining grace. Surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run the race not only for the prize, but as those who've gone before us, may we leave to those behind us a heritage of faithfulness Pass through by godly lives. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe and the light we live, inspire them to obey. Oh, 
may all who come behind us find us faithful. And when all of our hopes and dreams have come and gone, and our children sift through all we've left behind. May the clues that they discover and the memories they uncover become the lights that guide them to the road we each must find. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. Fire of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead, lead them to believe, and the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. Sing the chorus with me more time. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe. And the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. Oh, may all who come behind us find us So now we come to the time for prayer and dedication. And what's going to happen is Dr. Summers is going to come up here, and each couple is going to come up here with their child or children, whatever they need to bring up. And I'm going to open, and each head of household is going to pray for their child and wife and themselves as a family. And then Dr. Summers is going to close. So come on, we'll just go ahead and pray in the order that we spoke. So. All the couples go ahead and come up all, all together. Yeah, we'll all be up here. <clears throat> and uh, you can't sit down, you have to stand. So it just kind of rotated and out to step up to the microphone. This has been a very special time. Thank you all for your investment. Let's pray. Father, we come in the name of Jesus. And at this time, we seek to dedicate our children to you but as we think of that we realize that we cannot dedicate our children for in the fashion that you have dedicated them by the shed blood of Jesus on the cross you have laid your claim to them you have given your all for them and so it's fitting for us to dedicate ourselves to your purpose in their lives. And so we ask, Lord, that with unwavering faith, with determination of biblical purpose, that you would grant to each one of these parents, and then beyond that, Lord, all of us as parents in this congregation, 
that you would grant to us that we might be fully dedicated, fully surrendered, fully committed to that role we have of standing beside our children before you to raise them up in your nurture and admonition. We ask for the children, Lord, that you would bless them, bless them early with the knowledge of your son, bless them with parents who are gifted to recognize spiritual opportunity in the midst of human disappointment and sorrow. And we pray, Lord, that you would also bless especially their mothers as they set themselves apart entirely to raise these little ones for you that you would give them wisdom and grace and sight. You would bless the husbands, Lord, with knowledge that they can come alongside and give direction so that our hearts desire that we bring our little ones to you, Lord, that that would be met and satisfied fully. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Um, we pray, I pray for all the kids. We have a, the blessing today and also for Jaden. Thank you, Lord, for today. And thank you, Lord, for blessing my son and all the kids in this world. And please, Lord, um, protect him in any way he, he decides on his life and follow your way, Jesus, and teaching him on the correct way. And let him know the knowledge to know about you, so and please, Lord, protect all the the kids around the world, and they need to be with wisdom to know about you, Lord, and open the eyes for other people to know you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for this blessing. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Lord, I <clears throat> thank you for this little boy that you've blessed us with in our family. Such a, a joy and a delight to us all to see as he grows and, and <clears throat> has such a cheerful, pleasant demeanor. I thank you for just how you have seen fit to give us one more child to our family. <clears throat> and made us stewards. He is your child. He was your idea. I pray, Lord, that we could be faithful stewards as we raise him <clears throat> for you, for your glory, and for your kingdom. <clears throat> I pray that you'll bless him, bless Micaiah with, um, with wisdom, that he will grow to be a mighty man of God. And I thank you, Lord, for my wife, Abby, for her willingness to give up her, her uh, simple pleasure and, and happiness and health in bringing children into this world. I thank you for her sacrifice to our family and to these children to bring them into the world. I pray, Lord, that, you would, that your word would be true and that she would be saved in childbearing. And that um, as, as she obeys you, as she has obeyed you in this, that you would, <clears throat> that you would, um, that you would just bless her, Lord. Thank you for my wife. In your name I pray, amen. Dear Lord, thank you for the blessing of, of development and birth and just the children in general. To just thank you for how much goes on and, and how it all works out by your hand every single time. And I just, just pray for those who, who aren't able to have children or, or who have had miscarriages. I just uh, pray that you would be with them right now and, and comfort them. 
and I just thank you for our little Esther and also for, for Justin, but just I just pray that Esther would grow into a godly young young woman who loves you and, and serves you and, and uh, who is strong and, and will stand for you when times are hard. Uh, I just pray that you would help her to be brave, bold, and confident in, in, in who you have made her to be. And I just thank you for the blessing that she is to us and, and for my wife as she cares for them and, and, and trains them and, and for uh, me as I help to, to train. I just, I just, pray, just, I just pray that, that we would be diligent and, and faithful in raising and training them uh, for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for who you are and thank you for the, um, uh, the privileges you have given Michaela and I of uh, uh, raising a, a little one. And I pray that you would help us to um, disciple Liam in the way that he should go and in the nurture and admonition of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, it's not something that we can do on our own strength and I pray that we would remember that every day and just do especially pray for Michaela Lord that you would give her uh, w wisdom and, and understanding and insight as she especially uh, is day in and day out moment by moment doing those things with Liam and I just pray that you'd strengthen her just give us wisdom and Lord I do pray for Liam thank you Lord for his life and I pray Lord that you would fill his heart uh, already at a young age with how much you love him and that you have uh, died for him and risen again for him and that he might come to put his faith in you early on and that he would have a heart that loves you Lord and pray that you would help him to find strength in your grace and that he'd be strong in following you help him to be a, a resolute protector a warrior for your kingdom and that he would always have that heart that is uh, loving you and, and, and assured in your love so that he can always be pleasing you and not, and not men, what other people think. Just thank you so much for him, strengthen him, and we just give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Dear Lord, just take this opportunity. Thank you. We can call you our Father. And I just want to lift up justice before you. We recognize that um, just like our own lives are not our own, but they're bought with a price, that um, justice is not ours, but he does belong to you, Lord. We ask that you would just give us wisdom as we raise and train him up in the way that he should go. And I pray that um, the truth that he's receiving would not return void, Lord, but you that in your mercy would redeem him. I pray for Sari that you would give her wisdom and patience and perseverance as she spends a lot of time teaching and instructing. I just pray for um, your, your hand to be at work in Justice's life that he would grow up to be a godly man and to seek you in all that he does. And we just ask, Lord, that you would preserve him and um, is grateful that, that we can call you our Father. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. This is a wonderful, wonderful day. We, we know what's in the future. In the book of Revelations, in chapter 19, it says, in, starting in verse 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it 
He should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treaded the winepresses of the fier fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his side a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus is a warrior king, and he has an army, and he's coming back. These children have been born into a time such as this. Children, welcome to boot camp. <laughs> For Jaden, Micaiah, Esther, Liam, and Justice, these are the ones that we are blessing today. And it's God blessing because we are his children and fathers and mothers don't give up hope on these children or any of your other children no matter what it appears because this isn't about perfect parents it's about a perfect savior it's not about you Praise God as one who's been through the fire. Dear Heavenly Father, these children, we have a faith vision. These are men and women of God. That's who they are. That's your vision. That's God's vision for these children. They were born into these families. This is happening today, not because there wasn't anything else for God to do today. He has done this for these children. And they're in God's army. And this is boot camp. Homeschooling, schooling, under you, your authority, representing the Most High God. So we present these men and women of God in faith before you, Heavenly Father. And we ask you to bless them with hearts of faith. We ask you, Lord, to bless them with courage to stand before your enemies with the full armor of God. Lord, we ask you to bless them with hearts which they do not ever let get hardened with sin. Lord, we ask you to bless them with the humbleness of Jesus so that your grace is always abundantly available for them. Lord, we ask you to bless them with hearts which are quick to forgive others. Lord, we ask you to bless them with the desire to walk in the Spirit all the time. And Lord, the foundation of it all Lord, we ask you to bless them with salvation at a young age. In Jesus' name, amen.